Good morning. Welcome to Web3 Wednesdays, where we chat through some of the complex and nuanced topics in crypto and Web3 at large so that you can stay ahead of the curve. So today I'm joined by two team members of Splinterlands, one of the largest current Web3 games to date, boasting hundreds of thousands of daily active users by some counts. Splinterlands is a digital trading card game that emphasizes user ownership and mechanically deep gameplay in short form two to three minute matches, where the real strategy goes into drafting a play deck, which is then executed automatically on the player's behalf. So here today we have Matt Rosen, Chief Product officer and co-founder of Splinterlands, who brings nearly a decade of game development experience to the table alongside John Monahan, VP of sales at Splinterlands, who's been increasingly involved in the Web3 community over the past number of years. So given their position at the forefront of early Web3 gaming, we are keen to hear their takes on lessons learned around structuring Web3 games, gaming economies, and where the industry goes from here. So guys, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us, Sam. All right. Well, to kick it off here, for those unfamiliar, could you give, you know, a quick one minute intro around Splinterlands? You know what it is and what's your grand vision for the space here? Uh, I mean, I, I the the whole idea for Splinterlands came out of myself being a Magic the Gathering player, right? As a child um, growing up, still collecting cards, um, having some valuable cards from back in the day, then also playing games like Hearthstone and various other, you know, I, you know, I like almost all genres of games, but specifically trading card games. Uh, so, you know, like most people in the space, uh, around the 2017 time period when NFTs were first becoming a thing, it was just immediately like obvious to me that, uh, that, that was just, that was the model, right. For combining the benefits of the, the physical games to, with the digital games, um, and so, you know, not much of anything really existed then, especially as when you consider like actual games. Um, so we, we went ahead and built it uh, and that's Splinterlands. And, uh, you know, at a high level goal, it's um, going beyond just asset ownership, uh, going to like full game experience ownership, um, you know, community owned games is, is really kind of the, the full, you know, 50,000 foot goal that we're looking for here. Nice. And I, I like the, the the transition from Magic into this. I'm a huge Magic player myself. I have a stack of old common cards that will probably reach the ceiling if I were to put it on top of each other. So I, I definitely understand where you're coming from there. Um, yeah, I think that's a that's a great you know starting point to kind of branch into the topics that we like to talk around, which kind of lands on economies more often than not, because Web3 economies end up being a major focus because a lot of these instruments are fungible and you can trade them in open marketplaces. So, you know, around economic design, what's got you so excited around the way that Splinterlands is balanced? Um, I, there, there's a few different things. Um... You know, one, one thing obviously with any any economy, and it, it's not just game economies, right? There, there has to be some actual product or service that people are going to pay for um, without an expectation of a financial return, right? If the, if the entire economy is every single person that puts in money is expecting some type of return, I, I, don't, I like to stay away from the, the word Ponzi scheme, but the, the economics are similar, right? If, if everyone's expecting a return, obviously that return's gonna come from somewhere and it's going to be from from other people who are expecting a return. They're not going to get the return. They're going to get a loss. Uh, and I, I think a reason a lot of the projects in the space currently that work that way have been so successful is they come up with really unique, interesting ways of obfuscating the fact that some people are losing money and they make it seem like you're all making money. Um, and then there's this like turning point where people realize, oh, wait, I'm actually losing money here. And then there's this big rush for the exits and, and things fall apart. Um, so... I mean, that, that's not new. It has nothing to do with like crypto necessarily, although it's a common thing in crypto, um, but it's just, it's just any economy, anything it needs some, it needs some core, like there is a product or service that people pay for because they want that product or service, not because, and, and like um, an ROI is not a product or service, right? I don't put that under that category. So, you know, any, any business in, in the world that someone makes chairs, right? You know, people are, people go buy the chairs, right? They're, they're paying for that chair because they want to sit down. They're not expecting, you know, what's my return on this you know, investment on this chair. Um, but, but the flip side is people can, you know, people can invest in the chair making business, right? And so they earn the return. The return comes from the fact that people are paying for a product or service. And, um, you know, I don't think we've seen a lot of that in the crypto space. I mean, there, there are certain things like Uniswap as an example. It's, you know, a product or service that people pay for. You pay to make your trade on Uniswap. You don't expect a return uh, from doing a trade. So that's that's an example, and and gaming obviously is that way in the sense that um, you know before play to earn games, people spend billions people spend billions of dollars uh, a year 
on games, right? Because they want to show off. They want to be the best. They want to win. They want to do whatever it is. Um, but they, what, what they're not getting is an, R, an ROI. They're not getting a yield on that. Um, so that's the product or service. It's entertainment, right? So um, we our, our main focus, which I would say is, is different than a lot of the, the Web3 games you see out there, is on creating like just a regular, standard, fun, engaging game experience that people will pay for just for the entertainment just for that game experience. Um, and that then leads to the potential yield or the potential returns that other players can have. And so I, I think kind of going off that, you know, overwhelmingly what I hear, and I, I, I really like this, driving it towards this direction is that both the social fabric of the game, the gameplay experience itself, and then ultimately the volumes that those things bring in, that's where value, you know, really comes in. And that's what gives game designers a lot of leeway in, you know, how do you migrate that value around the ecosystem? And, it, you know, a couple components of these gaming ecosystems that overwhelmingly come up is that you have your tokens, you have your NFTs, and then sometimes there may even be equity in the mix too. Um, you know, as you consider things like tokens and NFTs, those prices are wildly variable between the two. Um, you know, are there any key concepts within Splinterlands itself that keeps those two a little bit more in lockstep so that people who are participating either only in a token capacity, you know, somehow still have exposure to the NFT situation or people who are participating, you know, only playing the game and maybe staying out of the token entirely to the extent that they can, you know, how, is, how are those two tied together closely? Uh, yeah, so I guess there's there's three things, right? There's there's token, which is typically like a governance token, it's uh, part of the system. There's there's the NFTs um, that that are part of the game, uh, and then there's the company, right? You mentioned equity can be in there, so there's a company that that's doing the development. Um, so, you know, the, the way the way we see it, um, and the way we're kind of modeling it right now, um, is that. Uh, the company, right, is, is the one that initially sells the NFTs, so the packs or, or whatever it is. So that's how the company uh, earns revenue, pays its employees, and can continue developing the game. Um, and, and then from that point on, uh, there are lots of different uh, fees, lots of different things within the game ecosystem and using the NFTs, like market trading fees. And, and those kind of, all, all that additional value after the NFTs are initially sold goes into like the basically the governance token and a DAO that that runs that. And then and the governance token um, DAO and, and the game itself where, where the NFTs can be used sort of have a symbiotic relationship, where at least how I look at it, where um, you know the token itself is completely 100 percent controlled uh, by the token holders, or it should be. Um, and then they sort of they ideally vote um, to say, hey, we, we want to offer this token as rewards in this game. We want this many tokens to be a reward pool uh, for this game or for these bunch of games, right? And then, um, you know, that's that's what gives the NFTs value, right? Other, other than like being a fun game and a good gameplay experience, but that's what actually gives it like play to earn value um, is, is these tokens that you can win. Uh, and then on the flip side, by by the, the DAO or the token community giving the tokens essentially to the game to, to use as rewards, um, you know, there, there needs to be some benefit for the token holders. So ultimately, again, like different fees or different um, different parts of the game can require those tokens to be staked or uh, to be spent or whatever it is. So ultimately, the hope is that by by providing these rewards to the game, uh, it ends up giving more value back to the, the token holder community. And I'd say it's similar to like uh, any, any company that has, um, you know, a rewards bonus, like, um, you know, Starbucks points or like loyalty points or something. Or yeah. yeah. So they're, they're giving out their stuff, right? But the hope is that it, it comes back and returns more than, than it's being given out. So that's, that's, I guess, how I see all these, all these different pieces uh, fitting in, at least with Splinterlands today. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I guess within that, you mentioned that at some point the community can basically vote for rewards distributions. Um, was that right? Yeah. And so that that you know reminds me, frankly, a lot of something like Curve Finance, right, which popularized the the enormously you know controversial, successful in some ways, unsuccessful in others, but the VE you know escrow model. Um, is that something that you guys have also worked around and explored? Yeah, not not yet, but I think uh, I followed that closely, and I think that was a great model for a lot of reasons. Um, and I, I think that's something we're we're like 
going to plan to do in the future. I mean, one of the things I would say, we, we don't necessarily have a ton of like original ideas in Splinterlands, but what we do is like uh, me, especially, and a lot of other people, we spend so much time trying out and understanding all of these other platforms. I've lost a, a bunch of money and some of them made some in others. But it's 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 a learning experience, right? We want to see there's so much innovation of like really brilliant new concepts being put out. Some of it works, some of it doesn't, um, and we just try to see what works, what doesn't work, why it works or doesn't work, and then how we can apply it to a game economy uh, to just get the, the best benefits of sort of everyone else's work. Yeah, and, and to be honest, that's an interesting strategic approach that, frankly, in Web3, I think we've seen lends itself quite well to rapid development. Um, honestly, in, in Web3, at the very edge, there is very little commercial value in doing something like proprietary smart contract development, even though there's enormous social and infrastructure value, because other people can come in, given that a lot of this are open sourced ideas or even sometimes open sourced code, and redeploy them. So I, I think that's a perfectly acceptable strategy across the board, yeah. Um, let's see. So going on, you know, if you were to think even bigger, right? So if you were to structure a game economy, you know, kind of from the start, which pieces would you be paying attention to most today? If you were to start all the way over at a really high level, what would you want to make sure is in there? Um, you know, so one of the things that I think is really important that we're, I would say, pioneering a bit at Splinterlands um, is one of the few things I feel like where we, we kind of have our own unique way of doing it that, that wasn't taken from another project is, is I definitely think stable coins are really uh, important part of that. Um, I think anything, you know, so it's great to have a, a governance token and all that stuff, but with price volatility and everything um, for, for regular gamers who really just want to participate in the game and we're buying, selling, renting, you know, cards and other assets um, is a big part of that. Having a stable token uh, in which to do that is extremely important. Um, but then there's all sorts of different uh, issues, I guess I would say, around all of the existing stable coins out there. Um, and ultimately, you know, what, what we sort of inadvertently fell into with Splinterlands, and we tried to think through these things, is, is what I'm calling like the one of the first product-backed stable coins. Um, so basically, you know, there's all different ways of of sort of backing or giving value to a stable coin, preventing it from falling in price too much. Um, one way, which is really how the US dollar is, is stable, is that like you can buy stuff with it, right? So I feel like there's so much work in all these algorithms and things to keep to keep all these coins in crypto, you know, pegged to a dollar or whatever. But all you have to do is get a bunch of products that will say, we'll accept, um, we'll accept these tokens at, at this face value. Um, and then they'd, they'd have that value. I mean, if you, you think about Terra, which is the highest profile collapse, um, you know, if a bunch of stores and products, you know, all around the world accepted one Terra as $1, um, it would never have collapsed, right? Because then, then people would just buy it up and get cheaper products essentially on the market. So we've, we've, we've done that in Splinterlands and something, you know, we're, we're building out and we want to make, we want to make bigger, um, like a bigger part of the game, but that all our products are priced, like say a pack might be $4. Or or four thousand dark energy crystals, which is the token in this case, um, that would be a thousand per dollar. So, if the dark energy crystals price falls significantly below that on the market, it's just a discount. It's like a sale on our product. So it doesn't it doesn't ever fall like too too much, right? And it eventually comes back after it does because just as long as we have products that people want. Um, so I know that's, that's a very specific example uh, when you asked about like the entire game economy. But, um, you know, there's lot, the point is there's lots of different pieces and I feel like they all kind of have to be there to make the, the whole economy work well. Yeah, I know that's okay. To be honest, that one piece that you highlighted, that's a piece that I am actually quite fond of myself because I think that what we see overwhelmingly, unfortunately, are these spirals whereby a, uh, an ecosystem token is used to purchase assets inside the game. And that goes up real hard uh, as the game performs well, and it goes down equally as hard when the game does not perform well. And I do think that, you know, either doing something kind of like this pseudo peg, as you've described, right? It's like a, it's a, a demand side peg, I suppose you could describe it as, versus a collateral peg. Um, I, I think it is an interesting way to approach the problem. And I, I actually do see more and more people, you know, trying to approach it in that same way. So I think that yeah, that is the, definitely neat. On the side, right, that, then we just do the normal, then... Um, we have a similar mechanic to things like Terra and Luna, but only only on the on the supply side. So um, you you can burn our SPS governance token to get a dollar 
or you burn a dollar worth of gas gas governance token to get a thousand dark energy crystals. Um, and so that way, basically, if there's lots and lots, if there's extra demand for our products, right? So the, the value increases of the dark energy crystals, basically all that value ends up going to the governance token, which is which is where it should. So it's it's using the again, the pieces that we feel worked from other projects and and changing up the pieces that, that we felt didn't work um, to try to make something that that is better in, in the long run. That's neat. No, I, I like that. And I, I think um, one thing in particular about Splinterlands that is a little bit unique is the blockchain ecosystem that you guys deploy on. So, you know, uh, nowadays we have tens and tens of different options of different blockchains and side chains and layer twos that people can pick to. But you guys, uh, you know, you're operating over on, you know, kind of the Hive or Wax ecosystem almost as well, right? And so where do you see, you know, that position being? Uh, and what do you see like the benefits um, is there is there reasons that you would highlight immediately to say, hey devs, like come join us over here. This is awesome. What we're doing. Yeah, the game the game operates on the Hive blockchain, which is is an unusual choice. A lot of people haven't even heard of the Hive blockchain. Um, if you haven't, I would say that's uh, it's a really important story in in the crypto space as far as proof of stake and you know pre mines and all that stuff. How the Hive blockchain came to be. So I'd I'd highly recommend anyone interested in that stuff looking that up. Um, but, uh, ultimately, I guess from like a high level, uh, I believe that eventually no one's going to care what blockchain these games are built on, right? They're going to care how they work, what they can do. Uh, are they decentralized? All, all this stuff, do they own their assets? Um, just like if I watch Netflix now, I don't really, I don't go away. Hey, wait, is that on Amazon Azure or, or is it Microsoft Azure? Is it on Amazon AWS? And I'm not using it if they use Google, you know, whatever. That, that's kind of how we, we are now. But ultimately, they're just going to be games where, where you own your assets. You know, you have some governance control, whatever it is. Uh, and and the, the underlying blockchain isn't necessarily going to matter um, as long as it does, you know, those, those functions. Um, and so that being said, one of the biggest problems that I don't see a lot of people talking about in this whole space is, um, you know, we, we don't want to have any type of um, custody solution, right? The whole point of this is players can self-custody all of their assets, all their tokens, everything. Um, so that means they, they have their keys, right? We don't have them. Um, we don't control that. But then on, on most blockchains, then, then all of the responsibility is on the user then, right? So if you, if you think about, oh, we're going to try to make like a mainstream game that non-crypto people can participate in. You go out, you put, publish this game, you ask a bunch of people, hey, spend thousands of dollars or whatever it is buying all the stuff in this game. And oh, by the way, if you accidentally click on a phishing link or lose your keys or whatever it is, uh, you lose everything and then we can't help you with it. Um, I, so I, I just think that's a 100% non-starter to mainstream, you know, gaming or, or probably most any product and hive um you know has the the focus was sort of like being a blockchain based reddit almost it was it was web3 before web3 was even a term um and, and so the focus was really around usability how do you make this a better experience uh for regular people um and i take no credit for it it was actually you know it was forked from the steam blockchain which was created by dan larimer who went on to create eos a wax that you mentioned is a fork of EOS. So, um, you know, people who are familiar with, with those chains, it is similar, but um, it, it really has this focus on just how can we make it easier to, for people to both own their own keys and still be protected. So like, as just one quick example, a wallet is not just a public private key pair, like it is on, on Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever. Um, a wallet is, is a name that you create. So like, you know, there's Ethereum ENS names, those, those names on Hive is your actual wallet address as part of the, the layer one. It's not this separate service built on top of it. That's, that's your wallet address. It's the name that you create. And then there's multiple public-private key pairs that are associated with that, uh, that wallet. And they have different levels of permissions. And they can also be changed using a master key. So just using all these features that were built into the Hive blockchain platform, we've been able to like build out a system where we allow players to actually, they own their keys, they self-custody everything, um, but they, they can still be protected against uh, those keys getting hacked um, and even lost in certain cases. And, and so that to me is why, you know, a lot of people say, why don't you use this blockchain? Why don't you do this or whatever? There's more people, whatever. You know, eventually I feel like it's just going to come down to the feature set and not, not the specific blockchain. And, I, you know, 
our, our goal is to be leading the pack in that respect. And no one's gonna care that it's on Hive and they haven't heard of it. They're just gonna care that it works and it works better than the other platforms. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fun response, particularly around custody, because custody is a highly nuanced conversation, both on the retail side and on the institutional side. And um, even us over at the Capital DAO, a core component of what we offer is basically, you know, delegation and uh, certain custodial permissions, regardless of the chain or the game. And so the fact that you guys are already deployed on Hive and there's already these features in place makes it a lot easier, you know, from an institutional capacity to come in, build certain delegation hierarchies and actually scale things up. So I think that's a that's a, a brilliant thing to highlight for other devs. Um, and then even beyond that, I also like that you pointed to the UX, right? Because I agree with you on, you know, 10 years from now, nobody cares if you're deployed on ETH, Solana, Polygon, you, you won't see it. And if, frankly, if you still do see it, something is wrong in the ecosystem. Because right now, I mean, I'm using a Chrome browser. I do not refer to this as an HTTPS or TCP IP processing unit. Like I have no idea what's going on in the background and I don't care. So it all comes down to UX at the end of the day. And I think that so long as the space and games in particular keep driving towards that form of like really smooth UX, yeah, any chain is completely fair game at that point. Um, yeah, I, I just say it is, it is definitely important that everything like you can find out what chain it runs on, you can, it's possible to find yeah, out you can validate those it. secrets. Um, yeah, it's just that you don't have to, that's not like a main selling point of your application is that it's on Solana or whatever. Agreed. Yeah, and I, I, I like that you did take this kind of in a custody direction. And John, you may even have some thoughts here too, but you, you know, this idea of other players using other people's assets, right? Extremely popular throughout all of 2021, saw the rise of play to earn, guilds, et cetera, that whole situation. Um, you know, within your guys' ecosystem, where do you see the idea of guilds and the position of guilds, you know, kind of going forward into the future here? Yeah, you know, um, from a sales perspective, which is which is kind of where I live my life, it, it, I, I've begun to think of it really as two separate problems to solve. One is, you know, how do we bring value into the ecosystem in the form of capital? And a second distinct, sometimes independent, sometimes related problem is how do we get as many players, uh, give as many players access to the resulting assets as possible so that they can have fun playing the game. You know, the point of what we do is to produce entertainment value, like Matt said before. Um, but, you know, the idea of a gaming guild, I mean, if you take the word guild or play to earn, you take away all the buzzwords. I mean, it's really just that simple process of, you know, somebody has capital, they're deploying capital into an ecosystem or a company or a product or whatever it is. And then they're allowing other people to use the resulting product. Um, and, and that's all a guild is really doing. And, and so for, for us, I think we want to be as friendly as possible to that without um, taking any value away from those that are already in the ecosystem. Uh, and, and just try to accomplish this mission of allowing as many people as we possibly can to actually play the game. And so, you know, guilds did that very effectively. I think it took on a, a meaning. I think things got, got a little bit conflated with the rise of the old farm style games with play to earn gaming and that whole boom that really started up last year. But I think going forward, I mean, this whole process is going to continue to play a bigger and bigger role in all of this, right? Uh, so, you know, I think I think we're 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 very neutral uh, to to the idea of play to earn gaming guilds uh, because you know really we 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 think that we can help to drive the benefit that a gaming guild can provide to 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 the the, the masses, and that is access to the assets that you need to play a game at a high level. Um, and so, yeah, it's we're we're big fans and, and very supportive of it. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense because as a generalization, right, just seeing guilds as a massive player base and capital allocation, I, I mean, that's all it is, right? It is. It's just a collection of capital and a bunch of players who want to use it. Um, so that makes, I think that makes a ton of sense. And then I guess guys here to, you know, kind of wrap up at the end, you both are actively building uh, in one of the, you know, hottest sectors within Web3 at large, gaming. Do you have any broad advice for other Web3 builders trying to start out on their own, build their own ventures right now? Is there anything that you would really highlight as do this or don't do that? Uh, you know, my, my main thing is actually no different than any advice you give to anyone trying to do a startup or in any field. Um, you just want to build products that, that people want, right? That people like. When, when I built Splinterlands, it wasn't like, oh, here's a way I can get a bunch of investment uh, and, and make a whole bunch of money or whatever it is. It was like, I was like, if this game existed, I would put so much money into it, you know, as a player. Um, and, and so that that's the thing. And that's where we talked about earlier, like the, the value comes from. It's not it's not this Ponzi economic. It's 
it's it's an actual product or service that people want. So just just look for that. Find the thing that you yourself are like, man, if this existed, I'd buy it. I, I'd use it. I, I'd put money into it. Um, there's probably other people like you. Uh, and that's that's what you want to build. That's what you want to go after. I love that. John, what about you? Yeah, my answer would head in the same direction. I heard this great quote on another podcast not long ago, you know, that, that you know, play to earn uh, should be a feature of, of a great game, uh, not the point of it, right? And so that leads us by process of elimination to entertainment value. Make sure that you're producing something fun that's valuable to people just inherently on its own. Um, and, and, and you should be, you should be okay. I love that all the way back to the user experience every single time is what we should be driving towards. It sounds like, all right. Um, well guys, look, it's been really great having you both on. I super appreciate it. It's always great to hear from industry Titans who are at the forefront of, uh, you know, really bringing us all forward here. Um, if there's anything you'd like to shout out here at the end, excellent. Otherwise we can close it up. Uh, we have so many things to shout out. I can't fit it in at the end here but that that's what i'm going to shout out the fact that we had just have so many really cool things coming up literally in the next two months um that if you haven't checked them out i would recommend it both developments with splinterlands the game and also new games uh yeah. using a lot of these same philosophies and different things that, that we're doing i love it well guys keep an eye on splinterlands thanks a ton for coming out today hope you enjoy the rest of your day thank you for having us sam thanks sam